How long ago was it? It was just a couple of months ago when we had a little series, a first ladies series with our friend Andy Oak, the first ladies man. And we decided even though, well, (laughs) Women's History Month just kind of came and went and we didn't even touch base with him. So we decided it might be fun on a Friday to touch base with Andy Oak, our first ladies man, the first ladies man again here in KFGO. Andy, welcome back to Fargo, North Dakota. It's always great to be here with you guys. Thanks. So we're talking about a snowstorm, not in Fargo, but there's one that's moving its way through our region about south and southeast of us. And we're still talking about snow into next week. We're having a never ending winter here in the northern part of the United States. But down where you are and the White House, you guys are enjoying some cherry blossoms this season already. We are. It, it, it's in full bloom, but it's only been the past few days. We've kind of ducked in and out under the clouds of, of, of a lingering weather as well. So we, we may have had it better than you guys, which isn't surprising, but we haven't had it that great. But in time for all these tourists to descend on the nation's capital and some of the, the later spring breaks and stuff, the cherry blossoms, are in full bloom. And, and the crazy thing about the cherry blossoms is that most people don't know that they were planted originally by a first lady. First Lady Helen Taft helped design in the early 1900s the Tidal Basin, which was all but a swamp. And she had spent a significant time, amount of time in, in Asia and the Philippines and seen these riverside parks. Uh, her husband, uh, uh, Taft, was President Taft was, was governor of the Philippines before he was president of the United States under the McKinley administration. And, and she saw these beautiful riverside parks and these beautiful trees and blossoms, and she brought some back to the, to the United States via the, the Japanese government when her husband was in office. And she actually, she and the, the wife of the Japanese prime minister, planted the first trees along the tidal basin across from the Jefferson Memorial and in the shadow of the, uh, of the Washington Monument. And many people who come here and, 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 and associate D.C. With these, with these trees and the Cherry Blossom Festival, Festival don't know that they have Helen Taft to thank for it. I had no idea. I knew that they were originally from Japan, but didn't have any idea how they made their way to Washington, D.C. It, is it... It's, a, it's an interesting... No, it's an interesting story because they actually came in two batches. Helen Taft was first going to get them from a nursery in, in Pennsylvania, of all places, and the Japanese government heard uh, that she wanted the plants and said, no, 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 we'll, we'll get you the trees. And when they, the first shipment of, of, I think, somewhere between like twelve and, and 1,500 trees came from Japan, they were a lot bigger than, than uh, everyone had anticipated. They were also infested with bugs. They caught bugs somewhere on the way over. So President Taft and the Interior Secretary had the first batch burned right on the uh, on the Washington Mall, where so many people enjoy so many festivals, and the Smithsonian Institution is surrounding it, and the Washington Monument, Jefferson or uh, uh, Lincoln Memorial, all that. So they took all the trees right out in the middle of the mall and burned them. And then the Japanese government was so embarrassed by the whole incident, they sent twice as many trees. So 2,500 some trees came a year or so later, and those are the ones. Some of the original ones still there, uh, uh, hanging over, hanging over the tidal basin so beautifully. Wow, I had that's incredible. And you wouldn't want to introduce any more bugs into Washington D.C. than there already are, because it's unlike <laughs> North Dakota in that like nothing dies for a few months. They're just like bugs all the time. It's a swamp. Well, it, well it's a city built yeah, on a swamp. DC, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, D.C. was built on a swamp. Yeah. That's 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 exactly right. But the, yeah. the cherry blossoms seem to like the swampy soil around the uh, tidal basin because they're they're here. You know, over over a hundred years later. Oh, that's very cool. I like that. JJ, you, that wasn't the first lady you wanted to talk about today. No, I wanted to hit uh, Andy up about Pat Nixon. Who. Whose sure, husband has been a lot in the news lately, mm-hmm. a lot of comparisons to a Nixon and a Trump presidency, but not a lot about Pat Nixon in the news lately, has there? No, not really. Well, well I, I, I want to I want to hit you up specifically, Andy, about this is I just finished a book called Pat and Dick, the Nixon's an intimate portrait of a marriage. And, oh, it's amazing. and have you read that one? Uh, yeah, well, I I have not read the whole book, but. I've read the letters that inspired the book when they first mm. were released by the Nixon Library and Foundation in Yorba Linda, California. So I, 
I researched the research that went into the book. Oh, well, then then there's nothing that's going to shock you from this conversation. You could give me more insight. I was amazed to find out that one of the most rigid and uncool presidents in the history of our country actually seemed to be more laid back when he was with his wife, Pat. 100%. It was, I mean, I, I'm... I'm I'm old enough to remember, uh, you know, the, the, the outgoing, more, I kind of came more, more into cognitive thought and, and understanding the whole process a little bit more in elementary school during the Ford administration. But when you, when you know about the Ford administration, you hear things and you see comedians on TV imitating them and the I'm not a crook and, and you see them portrayed in, in, in modern uh, pop culture and movies and stories and biographies. And you're absolutely right, JJ. And I was stunned when I got there and 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 was shown a romantic Richard Nixon. Uh, he and Pat Nixon had a had a pretty had a pretty steamy, a pretty flirty uh, 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 courtship, dating period, and and early marriage and and life together. It, it's it's remarkable. These letters they had they had nicknames for each other, and he gave her gifts to coming over early so she could burn him a hamburger again and wanted to go up to the mountains. They, they were both, they both uh, well, Nixon was born in Northern Linda, California, and Pat Nixon ends up there via her family, and her family story is very, very difficult. Uh, her father just couldn't seem to make ends meet in anything that he did, from farming to mining and living in New Mexico for a while, and Pat had a lot of, a lot of jobs, and, and uh so, so her upbringing was kind of rough, and she helped manage the failing family farms and working herself through school. And she's actually she's the first first lady to get a master's degree, uh, Pat Nixon is. So she ended up to do very, very well and, and flourish, uh, even after her parents were gone and, and, and helping to raise her, her brother and, and sister. But she and, she and, and uh, Richard Nixon met in a theater group. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to even imagine uh, – Richard Nixon in some like local theater group doing comedies and tragedies and 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 uh, uh, little little performances and plays and little 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 theaters and stuff. But it was it was a very very interesting courtship. It's, it's remarkable uh, that you found that that book and, and find the same. And in in the book too, they they also detail a little bit about Pat Nixon's uh, work uh, with with lep- leprosy. And uh, yeah, well, how she was decades ahead of the times. Yeah, she really was. You know, Pat Nixon. Pat Nixon is. I mean, you, you know, uh, Amy, you mentioned that that, that there are some some uh, uh, parallels drawn between Trump and Nixon. There are uh, even more parallels to be drawn between uh, Pat Nixon and Melania Trump. They do more on the back end. They do more behind the curtains. They're not very public people, and I think this comes as a surprise, um, because Melania is a, is a former supermodel. She's been on the cover of so many magazines. Walk the catwalk, uh, you know, uh, swimsuit model, every other thing. And, and when she gets into this public forum, she's not as excited about being out there in the front. And, and that falls in line with a lot of first ladies of the past, but not our most recent. I mean, Laura Bush wasn't really just a, a hey, look at me, first lady, but she she did do a number of public events and, and maybe more publicly embraced the role. But after Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton, Nancy Reagan, Betty Ford, I mean, all these modern first ladies that are so out there in the public eye and, and embracing it as they do when you have someone. Hey, Pat Nixon, she acquired more artifacts, historical items for the White House than any other first lady in history. And when we think about White House restoration and it being a museum and on display, we think of Jacqueline Kennedy, of course, because Jacqueline Kennedy did the on-air tour of the White House. She's the only first lady to get an Emmy Award for that uh, 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 broadcast of her tour of the White House when she had it designated a national historic site. And she did great work, phenomenal work. It was, for obvious reasons, cut short because of the assassination of her husband. So we don't know what she would have done in the, in the following years or if there had been a re-election. But Pat Nixon comes in a couple administrations later and picks up the baton and runs with it and, and actually collects more items. But her, her leprosy work going into South America and, and, and uh, earthquake uh, relief that she saw, I mean, firsthand, she was boots on the ground kind of thing. 
And she did it without a lot of fanfare and without the media and without the press. And we only now, looking back, realize how ahead of her time she was and what a great humanitarian and ambassador for the United States around the world. She, she was the most traveled vice president's wife and first lady of her time. It's amazing. Andrew Oak is the First Ladies Man. You can find him at firstladiesman.com. Okay, in, in thinking of um, items that she collected for the White House, I have to ask, is there any First Lady item that you've collected in your travels across the country teaching and learning about um, First Ladies and knowing something about all of them or a lot about all of them? Is there anything that you have collected along your journeys that you're like, this is my favorite First Lady Piece or something uh, to that effect. An, an, an item that I that, that I that I now own. Yes. No. It's okay, a but very short answer. Because, okay, item you've seen. Take, yeah, yeah. Items that items I've seen for for sure. I mean, the, the the memories and the stuff. I mean, I would say the greatest things I have to show for all of my travels are my books because people are interested in them. They read them. They get these stories. They get to go to these places through my eyes that maybe they won't get to for some reason, and all the learning that I did. But one of the more remarkable artifacts that that relates directly to the White House, which I think is absolutely incredible, at the Monroe House outside of uh, 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 um, Charlottesville, Virginia, it's called Ashlawn Highland. It's the second home that the Monroes would have together. In Elizabeth and James Monroe's bedroom, the, the fifth president and first lady of the United States, there's a dresser. And I was told to pull the drawer out of the dresser and flip it over. And I was very, very nervous about this because I said, is this an original piece? And the guy said, yeah, 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 but we do it all the time. Come on, I'll help you. So I pulled the drawer out of Elizabeth Monroe's dresser, flip it over on the bed, and written in black charcoal, it says, deliver to the White House, Washington, D.C. I, this is a significant piece that saw some significant travel. The Monroe's were very well internationally traveled as he was Secretary of State for, uh, for Jefferson. And, and did a lot of work in other administrations, and Mrs. Monroe would go with him on a, on a lot of this international travel, and they brought back a lot of pieces. And this is a piece that would have traveled, you know, across the, across the Atlantic and, and to wow. Virginia and up to the White House. And to think that this piece is still there with just a little handwritten note on the bottom of the drawer so the delivery people would know to throw it on the, you know, horse-drawn carriage, take it up to the White House, and then to have it back in their house after, uh, it's just, there's there's stuff in every nook and cranny of every single one of these places. I write about all of them in Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And and those books are my greatest artifacts as, as they relate to these first ladies. Firstladiesman.com. You can order both Volume 1 and Volume 2 of Unusual for Their Time. You will not be disappointed. As well at KFGO.com, you can go back and listen to all of our podcasts with Andrew Oak. The first ladies' man. Thanks so much, Andrew. You have a great weekend. Anytime. You guys do the same. Stay warm out there.